Professor Gerritsen, we're very happy to have you here with us today to answer some questions for us. So starting off, I was very interested in the quote that you wrote, that algebra is not just useful, it also is inherently beautiful. That's not the first thing that would come to people's minds when they think of algebra. So I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, you're right. It's not the first thing. And probably a lot of people think, oh, this, these mathematicians, you know, that fell in love with their own subject that find it beautiful. But in the talk today, I actually showed some art as well that comes out of linear algebra. So it's literally beautiful. But it is also figuratively speaking beautiful because, you know, the algebra that we work with and that is the basis, the core of science and engineering really is, is, is very beautiful to work with. You know, it's very interesting to develop algorithms you know, um, for solving complex problems in the world, uh, be it in, in energy or, or be it in, in, in um, engineering processes or physics. Um, and the math that comes out is uh, intriguing. And, and, you know, it gives us a really good feeling and that's why we call it beautiful. And at what moment in your career do you think that word beautiful popped into your mind to describe the field that you were studying? Oh, I have found algebra or math beautiful ever since I was a little kid, I have to say. There's always been something intriguing about manipulating numbers and variables and come up with solutions. So for me, in the beginning, it was just a puzzle, like a little game that I was playing. And when you have an intricate puzzle, it can be very beautiful as well. You probably have, have uh, experienced that yourself. And so for me, mathematics was like that. And then at some point, it became like a language. You know, math has its own language, it's its own constructs and its own rules. And when you learn how to manipulate that, it can be, can be really wonderful. <laughs> so I've found it beautiful for quite a long time. But in the last... Uh, Ten years or so, it's really gotten even more dearer to me, just because I'm running an institute now with lots of graduate students who work in the area of mathematics and computational mathematics, and I see their excitement, and that sort of that rubs off. And what sort of things are you working on with your students in lab? I do lots of different things with mathematics. Uh, I really like fluid flows. Anything that flows, be it water or air or blood flow, you know, I, I'm fascinated by it. And I like to use math to simulate this, to, to try to solve it, maybe even help with the design of some processes. You know, uh, one of the things that I work on a lot is uh, oil and gas reservoirs. Um, this is in the energy area. Now that may not sound very intriguing, but it's actually fascinating to try to find out how to produce oil and gas, but in a way that doesn't hurt the environment as much as it, as it typically does. Um, I also have worked on coastal ocean flows, tidal flow models, uh, really like those. I've worked on a sail design for the America's Cup, you know, where the, you're looking at airflow past sails. Uh, but some of the other things I like doing is, uh, is much more um, uh, computational mathematics uh, for its own right, so looking at algorithms irrespective of the applications. Uh, and an area of that is called numerical analysis, and that's a lot of fun. It's a little theoretical, maybe a little bit more abstract, but it's quite beautiful too. And what has been your personal favorite application that you've worked on? My favorite application? Uh, well, that's probably a project that I did for National Geographic when we were using mathematics and computer simulations to help design a flying pterosaur, a uh, pterodactyl. <laughs> but that was a crazy project and it probably was my most entertaining project. And I got into that because uh, I knew a little bit about sails and the wings of a pterosaur, they actually look a bit like a sail. Um, they're membrane wings and uh, they also have a mast that's the wing finger and then the sails were coming off. And they asked me to help uh, model these, these wings for this, uh, for this particular uh, uh, movie that they were creating. Uh, but it ended up being a very interesting project for many, many reasons. You know, we're working as uh, engineers together with paleontologists and artists to, to try to make this thing fly. I bet people would never think that with a math background you can get to designing pterodactyl wings for a movie. That's just fantastic. And this is the nice thing with mathematics. You know, if you know your mathematics and you know your physics, maybe a bit of chemistry as well, so you have all these foundations, there is no limit to what you can do. 
Now you can dive into other applications and learn about the, the, the physics or the engineering relatively quickly. You know, there's a bit of a learning curve, of course. But if you know the math, you see that the math used in these areas is very similar. And that, to me, was an incredible eye-opener. You know, so I've worked on search engines, and I've worked on tidal flow models, and sills, and oil and gas, and, and people look at me and say, well, how come you're so widespread, and are you spread too thin? But I say, no, really, the mathematics behind it is all the same. I see. And how does fossil energy fit into this picture, using mathematics? So for fossil energy, I work a lot on production, uh, strategies for oil and gas reservoirs and particularly now for oil that is very heavy so the oil prices have increased over the last decade right and even though that has helped uh, with renewable energy because it's more cost competitive it's also cost that um, heavy oil which was too expensive before to get out of the ground is now being unlocked so a lot of heavy oil reserves are, are being produced and unfortunately, heavy oil is not the most environmentally friendly oil. And so we're working with colleagues to try to create processes for the production that leave some of the guck in this heavy oil behind in the reservoir so that we don't have to get rid of it once it comes to the surface. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's my area there, fossil fuels. I also do renewable energy, though. I work on wind energy, too. Uh, where we do uh, uh, placement optimizations of wind turbines in farms, you know, finding out where the best locations are for wind turbines to be positioned. And, um, and I work a bit on tidal turbine flow as well. So when you put a turbine in a tidal flow to extract energy, that's a, a new form of renewable energy. And it's very tricky because the water is a very, very heavy, right, compared to air. So the forces on these turbines are tremendously large and it's very difficult to design them well so that they don't break and, and you can actually extract a decent amount of energy. Wow, well I, I would have to say it takes a very smart woman in order to be able to use math to solve all, all of these problems. It just takes a little bit of mathematics, <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Well, is there anything else that you would like to cover today that we haven't touched upon yet? Oh, well, thanks very much for sharing this. I, want, I know that you're connected with the School of Medicine, and one of the things, uh, of course, that maybe you know and other people would like to know is that math is incredibly important in medicine as well. And so with our institute, we work on uh, cancer research, we work on uh, computational surgery, helping surgeons you know, with haptic surgery, for example, and there's so many other applications. And, uh, and it's a wonderful area to work in. Well, I'll think of you whenever I see those applications. Thank you Thank very you. much, Professor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay.